share the knowledge that I have. Uh, my name is Valencia Davis. I am the CEO of Valencia New World. I'm a psychiatrist as well as a life coach. And I'm here because um, when Cassandra reached out to me, um, we discussed, I have familiarity with, on both sides, on both levels. I, with the psychiatry, I know how quick it is for a psychiatrist to get that pad out right in the script. I don't believe that. Um, but I also homeschool a few children with um, autism as well as ADHD. So I'm on kind of on different, both sides of um, the mental health realm. So I'm here to help in any way that I can. Yes, I'm Archie Beslow. I'm a mentor, I'm a coach, I'm a retired police officer. Um, I coach high school football, I have two books out, and I started a radio show. Um, I've dedicated my life to the youth. That's my calling, that's what I want to do. Um, I just want to get to the bottom of what's going on. I want to break the cycles, and I'm honored that Ms. Overby, she came to my book signing, and, and, um, and I told her, whatever you need from me, let's do it. So I'm here. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I did formulate some um, questions to um, present to the panel, but um, I also want it to be interactive. If there's any question that you all may have to um, give to the panel in order for them to answer, uh, we can do that at the end. Okay? And if you all need any um, pen and uh, paper or water or anything, it's right here. Just let me know and I'll get that for you. Okay? Now, the first question I want to present to the panel is... Now, people here. I'm sorry. Hi, sorry. we're from Kim. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I apologize. It's okay. Um, my name is Sheena. Dante. Um, what we do in the district, we're a mobile stabilization unit. We usually come out in teams of two. That's why both of us are here. And we come to assess children who are at risk um, would be a range of different things. Um, there's usually two master's level clinicians on site in the 24 hour service. Um, so within an hour, maybe two, depending on how busy it is, we'll be at a house, school, anywhere, as long as it's in the district. If it's a foster kid, we will travel outside the district. We complete an assessment as well as try to come up with a plan to ensure safety. Um, our goal is prevention. We try to prevent further escalation. Um, we can do an appointment on the spot if a child doesn't have therapy, if um, they don't have a psychiatrist, we, we get the services in the home as well as um, if there's more support that's needed, we, we move forward and um, go for further evaluation at the hospitals and um, any other present hospitalization. We also try to find linkage to yeah. community based services like Hillcrest yeah. and Family Matters. Yeah. And um, that's pretty much. All right, we, we just, we're, we're here to stabilize anything that happens. I think it, you have to be at, at least 18 unless you're in the system. And we do go up to 21. You have to be 18? At the oldest. Oh, the oldest. Okay. Eight, 18 and younger. Okay. Unless you're um, in the system, but then it's 21 and younger. Okay, and you do have literature, I see also. Yeah, we brought little shorts and little gadgets <laughs> okay. and stuff. All right. Thank you. Um, I, like I said, I do have um, formulated some questions um, that are concerning that I would like to um, bring to the panel. Um, the first one is, how many youth are in the District of Columbia that you can estimate that are mentally, need mental health, are ADHD or have, can anyone um, give a statistic of how many we are dealing with in the um, DMV area? I looked on the, the DBH uh, website yesterday because okay. I was trying to identify the statistic, and it, okay. they noted one in five children that having a mental mm -hmm. one in five. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know the date. I, I couldn't find where they got <coughs> that from, but that was the statistic well, on their website. I'm just thinking that's still a little high. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Anyone else that may have information? Everybody. I'm right. sorry, say that again. I believe every kid. 
Right. Yeah, I think has some world, type of. Yeah. I think this world is hard, and I think yeah. if, if your emotions aren't dealt with properly, and if you didn't learn, and if you think, you know, um, parents and our parents after us, they didn't know mental health. So this is yeah. really in front of us. This is the age now where it's like in your face. Yeah. So I believe <coughs> with the world and just what we taught how to deal with emotions, everyone's suffering from a little something where you're just a little off and you can't seem to just regulate in some way. I think um, the kids in particular, 18 years and younger, with social media and everything, the president, every, being in D.C., period, it's hard. It's just so much. And um, I probably would say 100%. Yeah. <laughs> everybody could use a little more. So so But she, yeah. and, and to piggyback, that's very, so that's why our society is. We, we, we want to know numbers, we want to know statistics. Do we, all, do we even know that the statistics are true? Exactly. Do we know they're who's real? Doing yeah, who's doing it? So you have to realize, and like you're saying, this, our whole world, our culture is being manipulated. We've been, you know, people are just telling us things we want to hear, they're feeding our kids all these TV shows. So we have to, like a group like this, and this is what I challenge us, where every time I go speak with groups, we always pass our cards, but we never collaborate and come together. So this can be Cassandra Overview's group. We can, whether it be conference call, whatever, all four of us, all five of us, should be able to come together and talk about something so that we can become now become your resource to help you grow. That's what I want. Right, because <laughs> by, her, by her calling us out and we hear, and then we go on about our business, we're doing a disservice to her. So, well, we, we are mobilized in exchange numbers, and whether it be once a month, I think that we all should come together and use our resources because, like, I have a radio show now, and I open my radio show up to all you guys. You guys definitely got to come on. Right. You guys definitely have to come on because what's happening is Main Street Media do doesn't allow these type of conversations to go on because now what we're doing is we're feeding positive information to our kids and to our parents, and they don't want that. And that's just the facts. Do you know what I found out in, in reaching out to all of you all? There's a lot of resources. Yes, ma'am. There's a lot of people who are doing a lot of things. Just like you all are just coming together. You all are phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Like you all are you all the bomb. Yeah. You were one of the first ones when you said we're direct responders. I was like, I've been looking for y'all. Yeah. But did you know about them? No. no. You well, know? Chris, we work with Hill Chris. Okay. Yeah. Everybody doesn't know about everybody. Right. We don't know nothing. I didn't know. We don't know. <laughs> okay. I didn't know you exist. Okay. And and it, and I've been in the community where I when they this is how far we go back when they killed little Daryl Bell in Simple City years ago and if you all were in this area he was twelve year old twelve year old boy killed on a bike left there. Like maybe three months back to back. Back. When they finally killed him, everybody swamped in. Okay, nobody went in with mental health. Nobody went in with mental health. They went in with the money. They went in and they got the guys um, into the little programs. And some of them are doing well. Some of them are not. But I would have rather you all came. No, uh, you all came because what happened was it left a backlash. And the city, when they went to go deal with it, did not deal with the whole holistic piece of it. They only dealt with what can we do to make this move, make them go away and be quiet. Literally. And so it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. you know? That's yeah. So piggyback on why don't they go in with that piece? Why is the first thing always um why don't they go to that's what it is. They need mental help. So why don't they go in with that piece? Do we need to educate them? Yeah, we do. Because people want to shy away from that. Yes. Nobody wants to, Nobody want to talk about it. touchy subject. It, it no. really is. Everything I do, I go with the mental first. Everything I do. Like you said, the exercise. With my fitness program, it's called Head to Toe Fitness. Because I start with the mind and That's then go the from there. Is. Because if you just go and work out and your mind not right, you're not going to, it's not going to work. You're going to keep falling off. you got to start with the mental. And then you have to pay attention to, like you and I discussed, you have to pay attention to the environment. You have to pay attention to that person that you respect the most. 
what are they doing? The person I respect the most is sitting on the couch and they're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. You know, you have to pay attention to the, the whole picture. And a lot of people don't want to do that. Again, easy is best. If this is easy, if it's easier for me to just, you know, just sit around and just do this, that's what I'm gonna do. On social media, I'm seeing everybody doing this and doing that. I'm gonna get it quick, so I'm gonna come up with a quick plan. But I'm not thinking about it. I'm just coming up with a quick plan. So that's what everybody's thinking about. That 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 quick fix, and we're not focused on um, where. It I went, and I'm not going to try to take over. You guys, when I talk, I talk. Yeah. <laughs> I'm motiv I know, Rio's on the motivation <laughs> speaker, right? Um, so my challenge is, that as I go out with all my accolades, I'm able to get into places other people can't get into because of what I've done all my life. Um, the challenge I find, I went to PG County, and I wanted to present to, I'm not going to give the school name out, I, I met with the principal, and um, I wanted to meet every Monday in the month. I wanted to talk to the, the young men first Monday, the young ladies the second Monday, the young men and the young ladies together the third Monday. What pissed me off about our conversation, on the fourth Monday, I wanted to talk to the administrators, the teachers. So the principal told me, well, no, I don't think, um, well, let's try to do it without, let's do it with the students first. I said, ma'am, you're missing a thing. You're missing it. And what's going on is society, we're protecting all these adults first. And we dealing with the kids second. And we do it so consistently that we don't even realize what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I think that just goes back to what you said. Like, what she heard was, you know, right. as a person, I heard the first perspective. She was like, oh, I'm going to cut that off. And that means I'm going to have to go that in and I'm going to have to listen. I'm going to have to listen, right. yeah, because your shortcomings come out. We got, we're, we're doing a disservice to our kids. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. You know, we, 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 what you guys are doing is phenomenal. What the panel is doing is phenomenal. But we are a small percentage of what needs to take place. The, all these government, go ahead, just, all these government agencies, I'm a part of the government. I get it, but I just think a lot more needs to be done. Well, definitely. <laughs> I just, because you know it from a point of perspective, yes. you've been waiting on the parents who yes. need this have you been able to identify or because you probably have more exposure to um, outside of the people who actually do this work every day, people who would, who would benefit from information like this? And I know that's why you have this passion and you want to get this information out. But you have been in, in places where you have um, exposure to these people. What keeps them from pursuing this kind of information? 
a lot of them are ashamed. Oh, a lot of them are ashamed of the that they have to. They're out of control. They can't. They can't control the situation. And to admit it to someone else is shame to them. They don't. They don't want to admit to another person that I can't handle this because I'm, I'm strong. This should not happen. But I'm going to seek help. But I won't tell nobody. Okay. And that's that's the onion. That's the onion. That's feeling that all the many layers. First, you got to get back to the yeah. of mental health. Yeah. You know. And the fact that I don't want to take on my school okay, because I got to fix it. That's my child. I got to fix it. Then, and I got to tell somebody I'm vulnerable. Then I don't know what to do. Um, I'm a parent. I have four children. My, my grown baby. Um, yeah. But, I mean, I have been to school. I have been to courts. I have been to hospitals. I have been to every. And I know that feeling of powerlessness. Yeah. That, and then when someone talks to you like you're already feeling like you got three heads and you go to a service provider and they make you feel like you got three heads and so then again it's peeling the onion and, and when we, we how do we create a, a safe environment where you feel safe enough to say I need some help can you help me and can you not judge me that goes back that goes yeah. back to the family component you have to identify somebody in your family that can be that person to take those people to those places that person. amen, amen. That person. yeah right you, you need you need you need that i mean all the outside like we don't know each other so i can be going through, going through something right now that i want to share with with someone but i'm not going to share with you guys i don't know you but if you identify that family component, that leader in your family, the person that you can trust that don't judge you, that begins the process of solving a lot of things that we're going through in society. Because a lot of people don't trust each other no more. You can have a million dollar corporation, you, can, you guys can be making millions and millions of dollars. Guess what? They're not gonna come to you guys because now they're thinking you want money. Everybody's finding excuses to not get help. So you have to find somebody you can entrust in to take you to the help. That's what we have to teach. Yes, ma'am. At times, um, from experience, at times you can ask for help and people look at you like you're not supposed to ask for help. Yes, like sometimes you can see in children the difficulties that they might go through and then like you will reach out, like you will start with the child's teacher and be like, well, I think that this is an issue. And then they'll look at you and be like, well, I don't have that problem in the classroom. And then you'll hear that, and then you go to doctors, and you ask doctors, hey, can I, can I get some assistance with this situation? And then they look at you with the judge, like, who asked for help? If I'm telling you I need help, evidently I need help. I can't do this by myself, and from what I've been doing, this, it surely wasn't working. And I'm not going to put my child on medication no. for no one. Because the medication is, is, is not to me what they need. A change of diet is good because most of this stuff is it's not really healthy. And you know, like from growing up, I heard wasn't with that you got mental health, whatever. You just being lazy. So it's just Sometimes it's a, a a back and forth when you're trying to get assistance and you you know you need assistance and you can't get the assistance that you need. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that that can make a, a parent very frustrated as well. And then for it to go on for years and years, and then you take your child to a new school, nobody knows them or she and then they tell you well i think that we should do this let's try this that that's what i'm talking about you know what i'm saying now like you got some people that look for help and they just can't receive the help that they're looking for right. so what, what are the answers because we, we know the problem how do yeah. we fix it exactly and, you know and, and i'm not i'm not i'm not naive i know it's one step at a time but if we do anything, what we, what would we come away from this saying, this is what we're going to do to make a, a difference from this one? I think that advocacy and transparency and visibility are important. I um, said I'm that person. Um, I've been in ministry for over 30 years, and 
I come from a what quote unquote dysfunctional family. Um, mental health issues are obvious. Alcoholism has gone from one generation to the next. I um, I have to praise God all the time that I am the one that um, is looking at the madness and saying I'm not going to fall prey to the madness, but what can I do to deliver to get my people, my family, my community out of this? Um, I'm trying to recruit <laughs> more and more people over the years to do the same thing, but people get caught up in their own stuff. And um, just, I've been trying to teach wellness and coping skills, and sometimes we've got to get educated, that's for sure and um, know what resources are available. And, and be, like I said, transparent, visible, be willing to tell our story of how we come as far as a testimony. And um, how, it's just, I came, I didn't want to share in this vein. I came today to support my sister and to be, I'm a parent and a, a guardian of a 16 year old right now. My sister passed a couple of years, three years ago. And my sister was an alcoholic. My mother was an alcoholic. My grandfather was an alcoholic. Uh, med Self-medicating, it, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, been prescribed all kinds of medications and stuff. And we've tried to deal with it from a wellness perspective, like I said, as far as the food and, and exercise and spiritual growth and development. And you got to have all of it going on at the same time. But that, that whole medicine thing, I, I had to come to a place where I had to heal. Because my niece has experienced the death of both parents by the time she was 12. And first at 10, father at 10, mother at 12. Um, you got to understand the, 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 the components, what happens in the brain as you experience trauma. And uh, it, it's real and it's not. And sometimes medication may be necessary to bring, and I had to come to this, bring somebody back to a place where they can go on. And um, if I, 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 I'm at that place, I, I had to heal a few months ago in terms of dealing with her because I don't want her. I, I, that's an awesome responsibility mm -hmm. that I have for her wellness. And I just had to see it from another perspective until she can, um, I guess, the, the get to a safe place. And she's been with me for three years. Um, she asked me if she could take the test. She said that she was, she, she's, um, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, but um, she's that too. I, I didn't know about the two. The two is that no, the two is it's, it's, in, it's in the middle. The uh, one, you go way up and you way down. But she, she's in the middle. But I mean, sometimes she is going around dancing and she's, this is on the outside. This is the baby on the outside. What's in and inside is a cry for help. But, and then other times, I mean, she just sleeps. She's just sleeping this kid. <laughs> just, and that's without the medicine. But, um, Right now, I mean, I'm surrendering. I, with all that I know and being in, in the in, in, in mental health and wellness field, the spiritual, all of that, I'm like, um, we got to talk about this more. Mm -hmm. And like I said, be visible, transparent, and have our advocacy boots on and go out into the community. Everybody's child is my child. Yep. Yeah. Um, and and uh, what you were saying in terms of the boundaries as far as service delivery is concerned, they are just I've had dollars to do work in the community and the door been open and ain't nobody gotta know about me where these people come mm -hmm. from. Thank you for letting me share. <laughs>
Yeah, she doesn't have to recreate the wheel. Like, but she does reach in the end. She reaches out to you guys. You all become the support, you know, in a group of people, this nucleus, that this is what we're going to do. Because, you know, we're, we're doing this in two hours. We, we could discuss about Christ and the Father's amazing that you're here. Uh, I'm just Joe Bowen.
it's so hard to figure out what to do. Um, so at least I like to think education is a key component in reducing the stigma of mental illness, identifying problems, um, what's causing it, and feeling free to talk about it. Like that's why I'm so happy that this dialogue is happening, just because people are interested in learning more about mental health, learning more about what they can do and how it's impacting um, their communities. So I like to think mental health is so multifaceted. Like everyone here has a physical health. Normally when you go to the doctor, they like check your pupils and your heart rate, your blood pressure. But so often no one's asking how you're feeling emotionally, what's going on in your mind. And everyone here has a mental health just like you have a physical health. And especially with youth too, in addition to like the stigma that society has about mental illness, um, peers come into it too, teachers, parents, everyone who's encountering children, it's so important that they're active listeners and understand the, uh, the signs and symptoms of mental illness and know what to do. And it's hard. It's so hard to know what to do because every situation is different. There's so many factors which go into mental illness um, with youth, but it's just important as community leaders and parents and people who are interacting with children and youth um, is to be open and understanding and just try to be present in any way possible. Just because having someone like whether it be a parent or as you were saying, like anyone who is really impacting a child's life, it's important that they just try to be there. And it's tiring and it's hard and I can't even, like as a, as a sibling, my brother um, has ADHD, my uncle was an alcoholic, my grandfather was an alcoholic. It's, it's hard even in that perspective and I couldn't even imagine having a child and and feeling that sense of confusion and that your problems like are overlooked and unimportant, but it's just, I guess, keeping that willpower and strongness and just keeping that sense to continue to educate yourself and grow and just work with what you got. Um. So for me, it's, um, <laughs> first of all, I'm a mother of seven. I have four boys, three girls. As you stated, 100%, all of us have something going on. And what I try to do with my children is I tell my children all the time, like we, we have family meetings all through. My kids go through depression. My kids go through same stuff everybody go through. I try to explain to people, um, just because I'm a psychiatrist does not mean I'm perfect. Um, it means I'm human, you know. My kids aren't perfect, they're perfect for me, but they're not perfect. You know, they go through things too. But the way I try to get rid of that stigma is I tell my kids all the time, you need to talk to someone. I am that go-to person for everybody. My kids, friends, everybody come to me. They got something going on, they come to me. And I'm okay with that. But I let them know, I need somebody to talk to as well. Because if we keep taking all that stuff on and on and on and on, and we have no release and no outlet, then we y'all going to be responding to me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I have a mentor that I've had for 19 years, and he's amazing. He moved, he's in Hawaii, but I burned the phone lines up. I call him, and he's like, okay, Valencia, just lay it on me. But my kids, I tell them, you cannot be everything. You cannot control everything. They're controlled by their mom. I know that. But I try to tell them, you have to talk to somebody. If you feel like something's wrong, you have to talk to somebody. Alcoholism, drug abuse, all of that stuff. It's not going to be my thing. So I try to shy as far away from alcohol, drugs, as I possibly can. Everybody's not going to do that. So I do realize with my children, you're going to experiment. You may experiment. I'm not going to sit there and, and, and throw you away. And, and Archie and I were just talking about that. They have to make their own mistakes. 
But we have to let them know that we're here when they realize these mistakes or when they feel the consequences of these mistakes coming on. We have to be that listening ear because if we're not, they may go to the wrong ear. And they may go to somebody that's going to further push them to whatever it is that they're doing. You know, your family not going to understand. They're not. My kids know, regardless of whatever I'm going through, I can go and talk to my mother, whether it's good, bad, horrible, whatever. I just brace myself, and I'm asking them, okay, which hat do I need to put on? Which hat do I need to put on? I need to know, and I brace myself, and I'm there. One of the things that I learned was talking to um parents of other children is they they want them to be who they want it to be. Yeah. Allow your kids to be who they yeah. are. And you can make your kids be who you didn't who you weren't because you made a wrong turn and you didn't you ended up not being able to be that athlete so now you want to push it on your child. You can't do that. Just because they made a mistake yesterday does not mean you have to throw them away today. They learn it. They learn from their mistakes. And like I was telling Archie, with my kids, they know. Make your mistake. But if you make the same mistake multiple times, we have a problem. Then we it, it goes to a whole nother level. My daughter's smiling because she knows. <laughs> but, I mean, we always, I keep that, you know, that door is always open. Um, as you stated, in the, in the mental health field, I've been a psychiatrist for 20 years now. I've written one prescription. It's just not my thing. However, I pay attention to the support system of the, per the, uh, the individual because if you are on medication, you have to have a strong support system because that medication can easily be taken the wrong way. Um, it, it can be addictive. Then you'll feel like you absolutely need it. And with children, I'll tell uh, parents, if your child is on medication, you feel like they absolutely need it, even if it's for school. At home, don't, don't give it to them. You know, let them be okay and calm at school. At home, let, allow them to be who they are. Whether it's a mental health illness or not, allow them to be who they are. That's who they are. I have a question. Because, um, Damien does take, um, I do give him medicine for school because I believe, um, the focus part in school, he was black. But when he comes home, I don't. They wanted to give him more medicine when he's home. I refuse. On the weekends and after school, I don't get him medicine. But Damien has broken doors. He has put walls, holes in my wall. He has um, just destroyed his room. So for a parent that feels that the medicine is working in school but doesn't give give it to him at home, what do you do when he's going through those? those you can give him home? a lower dosage at home. You don't have to give him that same dosage, a lower dosage, just so that it can kind of ease the edge, but at the same time. Because the thing that it's doing is the medicine is is just freezing his motor, his motor skills. It's freezing everything. And he's I'm not going to say zombie-like, but I am going to say zombie-like. In school, that's what they want. They want you to sit down, shut up, and just be there until the bell rings for you to go home. You're not retaining anything when you're like that because once you're zoned out, you're, once you focus on one thing, that's what you're focused on. So you hear stuff coming to you, but it's not, you're not retaining it. You just hear it and it's kind of bouncing off. So he may be doing better in school um, attitude-wise, and for them, they're going to write down he's doing better in school academically. But if you bring him home and you retest him, is he actually learning the work? That's the thing, because I have, um, I have an autistic child that when she was in school, they were abusing her in school. Like they were getting, and, and the aide finally just broke and told the mom, look, this is what they're doing to her when she had her moments and have her fits. She's nonverbal. And the mom came and brought it to me because she used to be my um, my 15 year old daughter's kindergarten teacher. So I've known her for years. So she brought her to me. She pulled her out of school and she brought her to me. 
now she's saying words, she'll mimic you and everything because I had that patience with her. And when she acts out, I act out with her. You know, I do different things with her to make her see kind of like that mirror. And when she see it, she's looking at me like, what's wrong with you? You know, and it, it stops her. But you have to get creative when you're working with people like that. And as a parent, it's overwhelming. But you gotta get creative. Try to get creative. And when he's acting out, act out with him. He throws something, throw something too. Then he might throw something else. But <laughs> at this point, yes. We, yeah. it, it's gotten to the um, you know, it's already it's already a challenge for teenagers. And being a, um, on, a single you know, yeah. mother and raising a fifteen year old son is is in itself right. on top of the yeah. ADHD is yeah. is it's, it's hard. But now he's not in the house though. So I've sent him to his father. Oh, and okay, how's that? Um it's okay on a, just like you saw him earlier. I get him maybe on the weekend. It's we have a different relationship now. I see um, where I'm more calm as opposed to me at him now. So that's that's different, and I like that part because now we get a, a dialogue to talk. How are you doing? How are you feeling? So I like that part. But as far as the um, the med his father doesn't believe in medication. Okay. So I don't know if he's taking his medicine. I asked him. But you know, as teenagers, sometimes they'll tell you what you want to hear. Right. So I don't know that part. So um, it's a, it's a little challenging because I don't, I don't know the day by day. But for the weekend when I do get him, I, I'm I'm enjoying the 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 relationship now. It's not all um, toxic. It's not all attitude. Yes. Yeah. But you you need to you and Dad need to have a conversation because y'all need to be on the same page. It's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. We we need counseling. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I was going to ask too. <laughs> is your support group or parents that are dealing with this? Right. I know I do. I don't. I don't know how if it's out there. Like, see, for me, I would take insurance. Insurance companies don't pay. That's just the bottom line. And a lot of people move away from it. However, what I've done was I moved away from my psychiatry. And that's when I start, started my life coaching business because with my life coaching business, it gives me the flexibility to say, "What's your budget?" Mm -hmm. okay. Or if you don't have a budget, sure. we're gonna we're gonna we're figure gonna this out. We'll out. We're gonna figure this out because if you come to me and say, "I need counseling," I'm crying out, "I need counseling." There's no way I'm gonna say, "Do you have $150 an hour?" If you say, "No," I'm gonna turn you away. No way I can sleep at night doing that. With my psychiatry in the office, I can't say what's your flexibility, but with my life coaching, I can because it's mine. So I can say that. So that's why I created that, that business. But I offer those services. I'm not sure um, and it's necessary because if you have a child that's going through anything in the family, I feel like the whole unit should be, my oldest son is type 1 diabetic. We almost lost him on several occasions. Okay, so what I did was he first thing he said was I don't want to tell everybody I'm trying get over yourself because people that's around you if something happens to you a sugar drop and you are non-responsive what are they supposed to do they don't know what's going on he's been found at a bus stop somebody thinking he was drunk he's been found luckily a little uh, steps away from my home by his friends and they carried him to my home. Luckily, I know what to do. We've gone through this for so long, but I brought all of his friends in. We, need, I need to meet with everybody. And I had a meeting and I talked to them and I counseled them. This is what needs to happen if he starts doing this, 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 or this. You have to reach everybody, the, the entire support system. Because if you don't, if he's around one person and I've already talked to that person, he's around somebody else, they have no idea what to do. So my household, they already know. When something happens, everybody get up. You know, everybody get up. Everybody need to know what's going on. So for you all, if something is working with dad, you should know what it is that's working because you may be able to do the same thing. I'm going to ask you, what is outburst? Um, it's outburst. Is, that's your outburst. Thank you. Like, most teenagers, they want what they want. Right. So if it's, if he's, social media. He wants a phone. And I tell him if you break a door, you're not getting a phone. I just 
the money that I spent, I'm going to spend for the phone, I'm going to fix the door. You can't have it. So that's the argument. That's the fight. Because he is obsessed with this social media. So he'll find ways or go get my phone to, to, to get on it. So that's what it looks like. Um, this is um, just happened recently within the last month that he's been with his dad and coming home on the weekend. So, yes. So yesterday he was home and he <laughs> wanted to know, right? He just wants that phone. So that's probably what he's doing that's 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 all day. And dad is here. Be quiet. Mm -hmm. So when he comes to you, he wants to know why I can't do it with you. What, what, what is his diagnosis? ADHD. Not only. Not only. It so should be. Can I but ask you, can I ask you, you go on the support group for just for the parents and the one or two six kids? So typically we like to make use of the access helpline for DBH to provide linkage to a core service agency, which can do home-based interventions for you on a long-term basis. Um, CHAMPS is also a resource that you can use. Um, Right. I just want to make sure there's a lot of um, thoughts about camps in the district, and and, and we, we fight sometimes with the people we serve as well as the pro other providers because it's this notion that um, I don't even know. Actually, I can't even say one direct thing, but I just want to make sure. This is one of the reasons why we're here, just to clarify and let you guys know what we do and who we are. Um, when we go out, like I said, it's, it's, with it's with Catholic Charities. Okay. CHAMP okay. stands okay. for Child and Adolescent Mobile Psychiatric Service. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so let's, let's, I'm going to go by step by step. Let's say there's something happening. You're going to call, let's say, Access Hotline. You can call us. An operator will pick up. You say, look, this is going on. They have to get the information. Um, child aid is going on. No school, medication, anything. They call us. Let's say right now there's a call. They will call us on our cell phone. Look, you guys have you have a call. Here's the address. This is what's going on. So, so with each other, I'll get there by this time. We'll get there within the hour. Once we get there, we talk to whoever is the adult first. What's going on? Let's make sure it's safe. Once we figure out it's safe, we talk directly with the kid. We have a uh, packet we have to go by. And it's just checking off marks. Depression, anxiety, what's going on with your sleep. It's a full assessment. It's a mini assessment of what the hospital will do basically. Right. Once we assess, we determine what needs to happen next. A lot of the times we push safety plans. Okay, this happened. Let's put everybody that's involved. Let's get them to sit down. This happened. This is what needs to happen next time. This is what the kids say. What do you guys want to do now that you know this information? But the way I see it as a clinician, I put the information in front of the family and say, look, now that you know this, this is what we got. What do you want to do? This is the plan that we think is best. And we also think they might need services. We provide them the research. So this is where I believe as a um, trans uh, crisis specialist, it gets lost a little bit. Because once we give the resource, there is no follow through. Mm -hmm. We are required to call and we are required to stop by the house. We go, we do that, but oftentimes, me being part, I'm part-time chance. I have a full-time job where I just do therapy. Part-time, every week I'm calling, what's going on? There, there was no follow-through. A lot of the times it's a call. Call this number and make sure they give you a date. Okay, okay, yeah, that's good. But then you call later and you're like, oh, I didn't do it. Okay, let's do it right now. No, 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 I'm busy. No, 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 it's important. You see, last this weekend, did you know something happened? Let's get it. Um, call me back. And I'm like, call me back. There's no call. So, so that's where it gets lost oftentimes. And then we get the rap. Chance is not doing anything. But it's just like, what do we you do? You can't do it all. Yeah, as, as, so yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people do well. Uh, so let, me, let me make sure that I, I say that. There's a lot of families that come out and they do well and they follow through and everything is great. There's also a lot of families that we kind of get, we get a cycle. We, say, we know some of the kids in the district, so we're like, oh, so-and-so, who went out on them already? Oh, you did too? How did that go? We'll collaborate. It's always the same thing. And it's yeah. just, would you like to use the Yes. Okay. <laughs> and we can be found through Access Hotline. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. That's 1-800 number you 
call and say, look, I need help. They have all the district clinical it's mental it's health. It's 888-7-WE-HELP. You tell them you need help, they, they're connected to all the mental health providers. They can call us and we have a call we need you guys to go. We respond to families, we've responded to, um, what was that one? Remember there was like a shooting at the Capitol last summer? Group of kids from Washington State responded here. They were shooting at the Capitol. Call us, we'll come to you. Therapy to everybody. But it's, it's you know, once you provide the resources, it, it, gets, it does get lost, unfortunately. And it's just, once we see those same names, we're like, oh, we know how this is going to go. You know? And we go and we do what we can, but there is that. And I'm glad you guys are here to speak on the, the community aspect because we are also seen as uh, the enemy sometimes. We're like, oh, you guys are the government. I'm like, we actually don't even work for the government. You know, <laughs> so it's like, we don't work, you know, we're Catholic charities and we're here to serve you, but you have to want to help yourself as well. Um, and once you get it, you have to follow through. So, and I think it, it, it speaks to you saying, it feels like I have three heads already. We come in and we see it and we're like, but we need you to call because if we call, they're going to say, where's the parents? Right. They're going to say, we need their signature. You guys are great, but we need them. And they won't let us go but so far. They right. stop us right, right. there. And we're like, okay, let's three way them. The parent, I'm busy. And we're like, and, and that's, that's wow. as service providers and being able to lead. That's something that we work on all areas and all levels, you know, of serving, of, of providing services. We run into this, I don't have time. Yeah. Come back and see me. Or this. And all the while, you're out of crisis right now, but you're not preparing yourself for that okay. next one. Yeah. Because no, we get the call again. We yeah, get, it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. So, it's kind of how it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, my organization is called Coach to Mentor. Um, just to fast track what I do, it started out by me doing school visits. I would, I was the only coach in the area that would go into the classrooms and sit with the child the entire day. Um, and I would tell the child prior to me going to the school, I'm here for you, I'm not here for your teacher. Um, and what I do, I would like monitor the teacher's behavior. I would see how they conduct their classes. I would see teachers that were frustrated. And then I would go back home to the parents and tell them, but well, this is why your child isn't doing this. This is where your child should be seated. This is who your child interacts with. This was the, your teacher's demeanor. So I did it on the elementary school basis first, and I went to middle school, and I started going to the high schools. What I learned is a lot of teachers are burnt out. Um, the administrators, they have their meetings, but their meetings are more so of a CYA type of meeting. So what happens is the majority of society is a cover your hind pots type of, when you debrief, okay, you should know what you should be doing, but I, from a political standpoint, I have to make sure you guys are doing right. You have to break those ties. You have to allow your people to communicate. Just like we're having sessions now, Administrators should have sessions with the parents. The PTA meeting shouldn't be, you shouldn't be in a PTA meeting just discussing grades. I think the whole discussing grades part is a waste of time. Because half the time the kids are getting bad grades because you don't have structure at home. So they're not going to get A's and B's when you're not monitoring their homework. You know, we came up, we had to actually go to the kitchen table, sit at the table and do our homework. So it wasn't, you wasn't allowed to have your phone, you wasn't allowed to be in the bedroom. No, you was at the kitchen table for one for your posture, to your focus, and those are things that we're te you're, te you're actually teaching kids what to do by giving them basic things. I would go in the household, speaking to your component. So my job as a mentor, I would talk to the, the young man and the young adult separately, then I'll talk to the mom and dad separately, then I'll bring all of us together. And what I tell mom and dad is, your job in this session is to just listen. Don't say anything back to what your child is saying. In some cases they do it, and it's effective. Other cases, the mom and dad, well, well you know, you know, how are you going to tell our business? I said, hold, hold up. Y'all called me here <laughs> to help the problem. But what, what, what's going on in families? So I'm divorced. All right, so, but me and my wife, we have, uh, we talk. We co-parent. We co-parent. And my son see it, so they respect me. I'm, I'm 50, and I still don't cuss around my mom or dad. I don't drink in front of my mom or dad. I'm living my life to impress my mom and dad on a regular basis. So now when I go talk to young men and young ladies, that's my intro. Look at me. I'm 50. 
I would never cuss in front of my mom. I would never drink in front of my mom and dad. I would. So now kids are hearing this from an adult. So now they can relate. Because a lot of our parents are telling our kids to do something, but they're doing it. So how can I be effective? So when you really need to hone in on your child, your child like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mom, you're not, you're not a good example, Mom. Dad, you're not a good example. Or that you don't follow through. You don't follow, that's the consistency part. Right. I, so when I talk to single moms about the dad not being in the child's life, I get it. Just have the dad spend at least one day out of the week where he calls that kid every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Whatever day you pick. And what, what happens over the years when fathers do that, the relationship becomes a great relationship with the kid. So now the child becomes a different kid to the mom because now the child is like, oh, my mom is allowing me to talk to my dad. And I'm looking forward to my father's phone call every Sunday at 6 o'clock. You know what that does to a cop? That, that gives the dad accountability and that lets the, give the kid something to look forward to. Those are my solutions. When I talk, I give solutions. I give, like I said, picking, identifying somebody in the, in the family. That's a solution. Setting up a set day and time for the fathers not in the kids life to talk to their child. That's a solution. To have meetings once a week, whether your kids are talking back and forth. If you have a meeting with a child and you're sitting there for 30 minutes and nobody's saying anything, that's productive. Because you have just taken 30 minutes away from your child to do something disruptive well, at least he's saying mom or dad caring about. If you do that for an entire month, your child will start to change. No matter what mental health issues they have, no matter who they belong to in the streets, they're going to change because now they have a consistency from the person they care about the most. I've been blessed over the years to come from Ward 8, Southeast, to go to college, to protect the mayors of D.C. for the last 23 years. Mayor Burr told me a lot. Um, Mayor Gray told me a lot. Mayor Williams told me a lot. Agent Fenty told me a lot. Mayor Muriel Bowles, they all told me a lot because what I did was I watched the trials and tribulations that they go through as public servants and they get bashed, bashed, bashed by so many people. Are they perfect or not? But it, it taught me a lot on how the community is really struggling. And the powers that be really don't have the res as much resources as you think we have. They give you what they have, but like Champs are saying, the people that are getting the resources, they have to do their part. So that's the component. We have to now start teaching individuals and families, and I'm going to hop on that. That's my mission. We have to find individuals in that family that help people in their family. Now, how many of you guys in here within the last past couple of weeks have reached out to a family member that's going through a crisis and say, hey, Let's talk about it. You have? You have? Every day? Every day. Right. So now, right. So, right. so, but now, so now you guys, by you doing that, so now you have to identify someone else. Right. Yeah. There, you, well, there you have it. We have but, to, I mean, and, 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 and that's good. That's good in theory. And, and it's good in theory. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, Dane yeah. and I, you, you've been here. We've been here. Uh -huh. I, I've, I've gone, I do home visits. I was doing home visits. Mm -hmm. And I go and I say, yeah, I'm give you five thousand dollars to go to school. Out of four years, one child went to school. Mm -hmm. You know, so it part of the 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 um, polarity of DC is that and I, I don't know if that language, but have a kid who's going to college and both of them come together because there's no difference in the way that they see things. Right. Mm -hmm. they, if you are under the like, um, I go to school every day, but I still get high every day. And there's no problem with that. You know what I mean? There's no problem with that. And I have a problem with that, okay? Um, yeah, I said it. I said it. I, I, I got to go home after this. And trust me, I'm, I live this. This is what I live. You smoke in front of your children, but you don't think your children should smoke. You you doing you doing the um what's that thing? You twerking and you don't understand why your three year old and your two year old twerking. Wow. So we gotta begin to teach right there at home. This is not what we wanna pass on. Cause somewhere we lost the value of us asking for help, getting help and being proactive about being a part of the change that needs to happen. We have to check people. 
I, we, and I talk about this a lot. We have to do, so my, my thing is with, when I talk to the men, we talk about LeBron James and, and all these people that are doing fantastic things, you know, NBA players and movie stars and all that. He like when I talk about the Atlanta Housewives. How can you have your child sit and watch the Atlanta Housewives and then you're going to commend them? Well, they're doing it. No, they're not. They're making millions and millions of dollars. They don't give a darn about anybody. And that's a problem. So, my, my, right. So, so my thing is, when you have dialogue, have dialogue to help encourage. Like what we're talking about now, all of us should go back and tell somebody about what someone said in this meeting. Oh, absolutely. Whether they want to hear it or not. That's how you begin the dialogue to bring change. People want help, but the consistency is not there. That's what we have to do. So I